Hello everyone and welcome to our module on bile. Bile is a substance that is produced in the liver and then stored in the gallbladder and after a meal it is secreted into the duodenum to help us absorb fats. It's made up mostly of water but it also contains some phospholipids and electrolytes and from a physiology point of view the two most important components of bile are the bile salts which help to absorb lipids and bilirubin and that's because bile is the main mechanism by which bilirubin is excreted from the body. I'll talk about bilirubin in a separate module. In this module today, I'm going to focus on bile in general and the bile salts. So the reason we need bile salts in our bile is to help us absorb lipids. So let's talk a little bit about the type of lipids you consume when you eat foods. So on the screen here is the structure of a fatty acid. It has a carboxylic acid group on the end and then a long chain of carbons and hydrogens. Also on the screen here is a molecule of glycerol. And if you link three fatty acids to a molecule of glycerol, you will get a structure called a triglyceride. And this is what most of the fats in our diet look like. Most of the fats we consume are triglycerides. They're made up of a glycerol molecule here attached to three different fatty acids. The way we absorb the triglycerides that we consume in our meals into the bloodstream is by breaking them down using an enzyme called pancreatic lipase, which is secreted by the pancreas. What pancreatic lipase does is it breaks down triglycerides into fatty acids and monoglycerides. A monoglyceride is a glycerol molecule attached to only one fatty acid. When it's attached to three fatty acids, it's called a triglyceride. The problem with what I just showed you is that lipids are not soluble in water, and there's lots of water in our stomach and in our intestines. So if not for the action of bile, what would happen when you consume a meal is that the lipids and the water would separate like I've shown on the screen here. Pancreatic lipase, which is water soluble, would then only be able to work at the interface between the water and the lipids. And it turns out this is a relatively small surface area. So there wouldn't be much area in which for pancreatic lipase to work. And as a result, fat digestion would be very inefficient. Luckily, we have bile salts. And what bile salts do is they emulsify the lipids, which means they suspend them in the water. And they do this by surrounding lipid particles and dissolving them in water. This makes much more surface area in which for pancreatic lipase to work and it helps to aid in digestion. If we zoom in on one of those suspended lipid particles on the last slide, what we would see is that the bile salt is surrounding the lipid particles and it has two portions of its molecule. Each bile salt has a hydrophobic portion which likes lipids and that will move towards the inside. I've shown that in red here. Each bile salt also has a hydrophilic portion of the molecule which likes water. That's this blue portion right here. So what bile salts do is they work as a bridge. Part of the molecule binds to the lipids, part of the molecule dissolves in water, and therefore you can suspend lipids into droplets to give more surface area for pancreatic lipase to work. Substances that suspend lipids like this are called surfactants. And you may know that soap is also a surfactant. If you have a greasy pan, you're not going to be able to dissolve that grease in water. But if you add soap, which is a surfactant, the soap will bind to the grease and it will also dissolve in water, and therefore you can get your pan to become clean. So now let's talk about the chemical structure of bile salts so that we can understand why they have one portion of their molecule that likes water and one portion of their molecule that likes lipids so that they can function as surfactants. Bile salts are synthesized from bile acids and two of the most common bile acids in the human body are cholic acid and chenodeoxycholic acid and I've shown their structure on the screen here. I've also shown the structure of cholesterol so you can see that the structure of these bile acids is very similar to cholesterol and that can help to remind you that these structures are synthesized from cholesterol in the liver. To make bile acids into better surfactants, they are conjugated to other structures, which means another structure is added to the molecule to create a hydrophilic end. The two structures that are added are taurine, which is an organic acid. This is the structure of taurine on the screen here. And glycine, which you may know is an amino acid. And both of these are very hydrophilic. And they are going to be added to this carboxylic end of the bile acid molecule to create a bile salt. And once we create a bile salt, we now have a better surfactant because one end of the molecule will be highly hydrophobic and it will like the lipids. One end will be highly hydrophilic and it will like the water. So I've shown this on the screen here. If you take cholic acid and you conjugate it to taurine, you get a substance called tauracholic acid, which is a bile salt. It has one end, which is hydrophobic, made up of mostly carbons and hydrogens that have shown in red here. And it has an other end, which has the taurine conjugated to it that is very hydrophilic and will like water. At the bottom of the screen, I've shown what happens if you conjugate cholic acid to glycine. You will create glycocholic acid. It also has a very hydrophobic end, which is shown in red here. And it has a very hydrophilic end shown in blue. 
And if we go back to this slide here, you can now hopefully understand from the chemical structure how bile salts work as surfactant. And now they have one end of the molecule that likes the lipids and another end that likes the water, and therefore they can serve as a bridge between the lipid and water environments, and they can suspend those lipid molecules in solution so that pancreatic lipase has more surface area in which to work for digestion. So as we have seen, in order to create bile salts, which you need as surfactants for the digestion of lipids, you need to begin with bile acids. And bile acids are synthesized in the liver from cholesterol. There are two synthesis pathways. The classic pathway is the major pathway. There's also a minor pathway called the acidic pathway. The rate-limiting enzyme for the classic pathway is 7-alpha-hydroxylase. It takes cholesterol molecules and adds a hydroxyl group to the 7-carbon, hence the name 7-alpha-hydroxylase. It creates a molecule called 7-alpha-hydroxycholesterol. There are then a series of steps in the liver which lead to the synthesis of bile acids like cholic acid. 7-alpha-hydroxylase is a cytochrome P450 enzyme. It also requires NADPH from the HMP shunt. It also requires oxygen to function. Now let's talk about what happens to bile acids and bile salts once they reach the intestines. They do not all pass out with the stool. Some of them are reabsorbed. This is called the enterohepatic circulation. So most lipid absorption of triglycerides occurs in the jejunum, but conjugated bile acids are not absorbed with the lipids. Pancreatic lipase releases the fatty acids, and those get absorbed by enterocytes, but the bile salts remain behind. They then pass to the distal small intestine, and they're absorbed by active transporters in the terminal ileum. About 95% are absorbed and recycled, and about 5% are excreted in the stool. And as we will discuss in a few slides, this is a major way by which cholesterol is excreted from the body. This 5% that goes out in the stool comes from cholesterol, and therefore this is a way by which cholesterol is eliminated from the body. So when most people think of bile salts, they think of emulsification of fats. That's because that's one of their main functions. But don't forget there are two other functions of bile salts. One is excretion of cholesterol, as I just said, and the third is as an antimicrobial. So let's talk about cholesterol excretion in a little more detail. Cholesterol is a lipid. It's made up of mostly carbons and hydrogens, as you can see on the screen here. So it is not soluble in water. In order to excrete it from the body, therefore, that means you cannot use the urine. What you can do is convert the cholesterol into a conjugated bile acid or a bile salt. It then becomes water-soluble, and it can be excreted in the stool. And this is the main mechanism by which cholesterol is eliminated from the body. There's a tie-in with pharmacology here. There are very old, rarely used cholesterol drugs that are called bile acid resins. These are drugs like cholestyramine and cholestopol and colcevalam. These retain bile acids in the stool and prevent their resorption so that more bile acids go out in the stool. And when more bile acids like cholic acid go out in the stool, that means you are eliminating more cholesterol from the body. These drugs have largely been replaced by statins and other cholesterol drugs, and they have nasty side effects like bloating and diarrhea, but a long time ago they were the only drugs we had and they were used more often. I talk about these in more detail in the modules on lipid drugs. The third important function of bile salts is to serve as an antimicrobial. The small intestine has relatively few bacteria, especially compared to the colon. And if you lose your bile salts, what happens is bacterial overgrowth occurs, and this is sometimes seen in patients who have liver disease. The mechanism by which bile salts prevent bacterial overgrowth is believed to be disruption of bacterial cell membranes. I bolded that here because that's what you should remember for your boards. There are other antibacterial effects that have been described as well. What I'm going to talk about for the last few slides of this module is what happens if you have disrupted bile flow to the intestines, and that is called cholestasis. There are characteristic lab findings and symptoms of this disorder that you should know for your boards and also for clinical medicines, and they all make sense if you understand what bile does. So the lab findings of a patient who has disrupted bile flow to the intestines will include hyperbilirubinemia. That should make sense to you because, as I told you at the beginning of this module, bilirubin is one of the main components of bile. The type of hyperbilirubinemia is a direct or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and in the bilirubin module, I talk more about why it's a direct hyperbilirubinemia when you have cholestasis. Another characteristic finding is elevated alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase is synthesized by bile duct epithelial cells, and when there's obstruction to bile flow, the level of this enzyme in the serum will rise. The symptoms of cholestasis include jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin. This happens when the bilirubin level is high. There's also pruritus. This is itching, and this is believed to occur because bile salts deposit in the skin. You can also sometimes see dark urine. If you have elevated conjugated bilirubin levels, the urine will turn dark. I talk more about this in the bilirubin module. And then finally, you can have clay-colored stools. That's because bilirubin is converted to stercobilin in the intestines, and that's what makes your stool dark.
If you lose bile and therefore lose bilirubin flow to the intestines, you will get clay-colored pale stools. Long term, if you have obstruction to bile flow, you can see fat malabsorption and loss of fat-soluble vitamins, and this should make sense to you based on what we've been discussing because those bile salts are essential for emulsification of fats and their absorption. To understand how we make a diagnosis from lab tests of bile obstruction or cholestasis, you need to understand the enzyme alkaline phosphatase, which most people call ALKFOS. This enzyme is produced by bile duct epithelial cells, and when there is obstruction of bile flow, these cells will increase their alkaline phosphatase synthesis. The mechanism is not completely understood, but what you will see clinically is that plasma levels of alkaline phosphatase will rise when there is an obstruction to bile flow. Now, hepatocytes contain the enzymes AST and ALT. I talk more about these in the liver modules. And when you have damage to hepatocytes, you can see a rise in the serum levels of AST and ALT. What you need to understand is that when there is cholestasis, the primary problem is with the bile duct epithelial cells. So you will see an increase in alkaline phosphatase that is much, much greater than the increase in AST and ALT that may result from damage to hepatocytes. This is because the primary site of dysfunction is in the bile ducts. There is some secondary effect on hepatocytes, but it's not as great. Therefore, the rise in ALT and ALT is much smaller than the rise in ALKFOS. To understand this, let's look at this picture. So let's imagine we have a big gallstone lodged in the common bile duct right here, or maybe it's a tumor at the head of the pancreas. This will obviously obstruct the bile flow from the liver into the intestines. As a result, these bile ducts will become very dilated, and the bile duct epithelial cells will create lots of ALKFOS. So you will see a very high level of alkaline phosphatase in the serum if you measure it. Now that backup of bile flow all the way to the liver will cause some effect and some damage of liver cells up here. So you will see a rise in the AST and the ALT levels, but that rise in the AST and the ALT levels will not be as high as the rise in the ALKFOS. So you will see a much greater rise in ALKFOS than you do in AST and ALT when you have a cholestatic problem or an obstruction to bile flow. And it's very important that you understand that. Contrast that pattern that I just showed you with the hepatocellular pattern of liver damage. This occurs when the primary site of dysfunction from pathology is with the hepatocytes in the liver. In this case, you will see a rise in the AST and ALT levels in the serum that is much greater than the rise in alkaline phosphatase. The rise in alkaline phosphatase occurs because there's some secondary effect on the bile ducts, but the primary problem lies with the liver cells. And this is the form of liver function test abnormality that is seen in many forms of liver disease. To understand this, let's imagine we have some pathologic process that's damaging the liver here. This will cause the AST and ALT levels to rise significantly. But remember, there are bile ducts inside the liver, so you will have some secondary effect on the bile duct epithelial cells. So you will see some rise in alkaline phosphatase, but the rise in alkaline phosphatase will be relatively small compared to the larger rise in AST and ALT. So I've summarized on the screen here the two characteristic patterns of bile and liver damage, and it's very important that you understand these two patterns for step one of your boards and also for clinical medicine. We often look at the ALKFOS levels and the AST and ALT levels, and we use those levels to try and determine whether the patient's problem lies in the liver or in the bile ducts. When the ALKFOS rise is much greater than the rise in AST and ALT, then the primary abnormality relates to the bile ducts. This is called the cholestatic pattern because this is what occurs when there's obstruction to bile flow, which is called cholestasis. When the rise in AST or ALT is much greater than the rise in alkaline phosphatase, then the primary abnormality relates to hepatocytes. This is called the hepatocellular pattern of liver damage. So on the screen here, I've put two specific examples with actual numbers to help you understand. So a normal AST and ALT is about 50, and a normal ALKFOS is about 100. The actual normals are slightly different than that, but that's an easy way to remember it when you're looking at board questions. So in example number one, we have an AST that is 100 and an ALT that is 120. So these two values are about twice the normal level. Then we have an ALKFOS level that is 500. So this ALKFOS level is about five times the normal level. So we have a rise in ALKFOS that is much, much greater than the rise in AST and ALT. And this is the type of pattern you would see with someone who has cholestasis, for example, if they have a gallstone lodged in their common bile duct. In example two, we have an AST of 500 and an ALT of 550. So these are both about 10 times the upper limit of normal for AST and ALT. Our ALKFOS, on the other hand, is 200. So this is only about two times the upper limit of normal. So we have a rise in AST and ALT that is much greater than the rise in ALKFOS. This is the hepatocellular pattern of liver damage. And this is the type of pattern you would see in a patient who has a primary liver disorder. Besides the pattern of liver function test abnormalities, another very important clue 
to the cause of LFT abnormalities is the magnitude of the LFT change. So a normal AST is less than 40 and a normal ALT is less than 50. The magnitude of the rise in AST and ALT gives a very important clue as to the underlying cause. And this is one of the most important things to know when working up patients with abnormal liver function tests. If the AST and ALT levels are 500 or less, this is a relatively modest rise in LFTs. And so the causes that lead to this level of LFT change are things like cirrhosis, chronic viral hepatitis, fatty liver disease, and alcoholic hepatitis. Most of these things, especially the first three, are sort of chronic smoldering processes, and therefore they don't lead to very large elevations in the liver function tests. If the AST and ALT level are in the 500 to the thousands range, then the two causes you should think of are acute viral hepatitis and autoimmune hepatitis. These processes cause more liver destruction, and therefore you tend to get higher levels of AST and ALT. And then finally, it's rare, but if the AST and ALT levels are approaching 10,000, there are really only two things that do this. One is shock liver from ischemia, and the other is acetaminophen toxicity. So in a board question, when you're asked about the cause of abnormal liver function tests, pay close attention to the degree of elevation of the AST and ALT. That will give you a very important clue as to the potential underlying causes. Once you identify the cholestatic pattern of liver function test abnormalities, once you identify cholestasis, the best first test after that is an imaging test of the bile ducts. Usually it's a right upper quadrant ultrasound. That's because this will tell you whether the bile ducts are dilated or normal, and this will differentiate extrahepatic causes of cholestasis from intrahepatic causes of cholestasis. To understand this, let's go back to our drawing here. If we have a gallstone lodged in the common bile duct, we will get very large bile ducts. They will become dilated and distended. You can see this on imaging. On the other hand, there are intrahepatic causes of bile flow obstruction. There are processes that primarily affect the bile ducts in the liver here. They can obstruct bile flow inside the liver. If one of those processes is occurring, then the bile ducts will be normal, and you know that you need to look in the liver to find the source of biliary obstruction. So if your imaging study shows dilated bile ducts, then you have an extrahepatic cause of cholestasis, and this includes things like gallstones, pancreatic masses, or biliary strictures. The workup of a patient with an extrahepatic cause of cholestasis usually involves imaging. You're going to try to image the gallstone or the pancreatic mass or the strictures to determine the best treatment for that problem. If your imaging study shows normal bile ducts, then you have an intrahepatic cause of cholestasis, and the workup of these disorders usually involves lab tests or a biopsy of the liver. Some of the things that can cause intrahepatic cholestasis include primary biliary cirrhosis, which is a disorder I discuss in its own module. There is a characteristic cholestasis that often occurs in pregnancy that is intrahepatic. Oral contraceptives sometimes cause patients to have an intrahepatic cholestatic problem. The estrogen can lead to obstruction of bile flow. And then finally, erythromycin is a well-described cause of intrahepatic cholestasis. A small number of patients develop this problem when they take erythromycin. There are numerous other causes of intrahepatic cholestasis, but all of these would have normal bile duct imaging on your right upper quadrant ultrasound. That's why the imaging of the bile ducts is the best first test once you identify cholestasis. And that concludes our module on bile.